people who agreed to the whole thing and people who um, sort of refused one or more elements of the uh, record linkage. Okay, so I'm just going to share really, the focus is going to be on sort of the participants, the research participants um, mainly, and then at the end I'll just um, put some of the uh, reflections from uh, what some of the um, people involved in the Ethics Committee or researchers said. But um, I really wanted to express how uh, the research participants uh, explained how they understood the study to me. And uh, so firstly, I found that um, uh, ALSPAC was perceived by participants as good quality um, health research. It was seen as not for profit, um, so not for commercial or private gains. And, um, and this was seen as something that was quite important in maintaining their participation. Um, I've put some of the quotes up here, so one person felt that they were like 100% for the good of everyone else. And, um, and, but having said that, uh, they felt very assured in that. Um, the understandings were quite vague about the sort of actual processes of the research, um, so they, uh, a lot of people said, I don't actually know what they're doing exactly, but I've got an idea that they're doing something to do with this. And for example, this person um, in the middle uh, felt they tuned into the fact that they were doing stuff to do with um, asthma and they were asthmatic. Um, but it was all perceived as sort of good health research. And uh, it was interesting because um, uh, the, the research participants tended to have quite, some had quite narrow sort of conceptions of uh, how their data was being used by the study. So I've included a quotation from one of those individuals where um, they felt that the data was just being used within this little sort of nest of, of ALSPAC and wasn't sort of going out beyond that. Um, whereas others were a bit more aware of the sort of wider collaborations and um, they may have been involved in sub-studies at, um, at the universities and sort of were aware that um, other people were involved. And I remember talking to one who was, one participant was a medical student and had come across um, ALSPAC uh, data sort of being written up in different research reports. So they, some people were aware of the sort of international use of the data. Um, and I just wanted to share really some of the findings um, about the research relationship which really were quite uh, poignant in, um, uh, in the, and really came out strongly in the interviews with uh, members of the cohort. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is the intimacy that um, they reported with the study. And so this is, uh, was in, on a few different levels. Firstly, that the intimacy, they'd invested a lot of time and effort in the study, and it was something that they felt sort of very, many of the participants felt very connected to, and sort of um, they uh, saw themselves as part of this sort of bigger uh, ALSPAC group. Um, and, but also, in terms of uh, the intimacy, they'd, they'd shared a lot of. Uh, intimate and detailed information with the study over the years. So uh, people felt like the ALSPAC knew them sort of better than anyone else. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the sort of repeated interactions with the study over the years meant that they'd, they'd from birth, um, been socialised as research participants. Um, and then the other um, really interesting thing that came out very strongly was just their um, special uh, trust and relationship with um, ALSPAC. So um, people just felt that their data was really safe in the study and there was a, um, the trust was multifaceted. There was a lot of um, different uh, sort of factors involved in it where um, people would talk about that it was passed on from their parents, where they trusted that their parents had sort of vetted the study at the beginning and uh, that their trust for through that, or that they just had positive um, experiences and not heard of any sort of problems with the research. And another important thing that people expressed was that they felt valued by the study as research participants and um, they felt that they had choice and they were able to impose boundaries on, the, on their involvement in the study, and that was quite important to them. 
But overall, there was, uh, amongst a lot of people, there was like a commitment to maintain their participating. Okay, and then, um, so some of the expectations about uh, data linkage in ASPAR. Um, generally, uh, the linkage to their administrative records was seen as sort of uh, quite a positive thing. It was seen as like uh, something that could improve the science and the research. And so this was um, uh, like, it was seen as something that uh, could help to um, make participation easier and to uh, maybe make uh, their uh, data more accurate because participants said, oh, well, I, you know, people won't be able to lie. Uh, we can, you know, the study will just be able to go straight to the data. Um, and they saw it as something that would be quite easy. Oh, you just, you know, grab that record from there and bring it into the study. And, and so that was all seen as quite a positive thing. And they also, some people reported about uh, people who maybe couldn't be bothered, who maybe dropped out of participating regularly that they knew, and they thought that this might be a, uh, the data linkage might be a good means to sort of bring those people back into the study. Um, so yeah, they thought really that the sort of more records the better a lot of people um, on the positive side of things. Um, and in terms, I'll just uh, mention uh, one of the uh, people involved in the ethics committee really felt that um, the data linkage was sort of like a, a key thing for the study in the future, really, and, and had massive benefits. So um, here they were talking about sort of participant burden and the, the problems of follow-up that cohort studies have to contend with. So they really felt that it was a sort of valuable thing to be doing. Okay, and um, I'm just going to conclude now on some ethical um, considerations. It's been a bit of a flash tour of <laughs> the findings. So basically, I found that um, the data linkage uh, sort of highlighted how uh, dynamic uh, longitudinal studies are. It sort of raises new challenges by bringing in new types of data. There's a new way of accumulating data. Um, however, it's seen as like a vital sort of thing in uh, the progress of the, um, of the study. Um, and the, the, the challenges I found was uh, that uh, the um, to uh, that this ASPAC would have challenges successfully communicating these new developments to um, participants, and uh, who like they've developed sort of certain expectations of the study, and, and also they have this uh, trust in the study, which means that they don't necessarily engage in the information provided to them perhaps as fully as, um, as they might do if it was a new study. So, um, so I just sort of uh, thought that it'd be uh, that data linkage and the special trust and relationship and intimacy that uh, uh, relationships that people have with the ASPAC study could raise vulnerabilities for both participants and their research because of this sort of um, issue where people might not be fully informed in what they're, they're getting themselves into. And also the broadness of the consent and data linkage means that uh, the data is collections indirect, so uh, people don't have that control and, and choice over their, um, uh, what's uh, given to the study necessarily. And also just the fact that it's sort of long-term access and the, the use of these records into the future, they don't know what's on what's going to be on their records in the future. So one of, uh, just to finish on one of the thoughts of the um, member, the, one of the people involved in the um, ethics committee, they were just really concerned and they said that it worries me that um, people just go, oh, it's our spark, they're great, you know, I've been with them for 20 years, I trust them. They've never done anything dodgy with the data, so yeah, I'll just sign up to this as well. So this is sort of quite a big sort of concern. Okay, and just thanks for everyone who helped and <laughs> uh, my funders. I've just got five minutes just to pick up on the concept of trust that Mary's committed to. <clears throat> um, so thank you for that, Mary. Thank you for giving me such a wonderful word to uh, spring from. 
I want to talk a little bit about trust. For one thing, I'm certain that there is a lot of talk about trust and how to nurture it and how to maintain it. There is also a lot of sociological discussion, at least, about what it actually is. Um, what is the nature of trust and what, is, what are the conditions for it. But we cannot actually always be certain what trust actually is, and I think that's one of the points that married research has shown. We may not be 100% certain how we define it, but we do know that it matters. It is said by politicians mostly, but others too, that it's really important that the public trusts medicine. The public, I think, as a concept, is almost as difficult to define as trust. Uh, maybe there are just things that we define when we see them. Maybe it's like trying to find Wally. You will know trust and you will know the public when you see them. <coughs> if only it was that simple. Unfortunately, the public, or publics, both terms that I'm now slightly uncomfortable with, are not things that we can simply spot and identify on sight. It's not like trying to find Wally. Trust is not exactly the same as confidence in my view, and for maybe at least in social science terms. Trust, as Mari has shown very nicely, implies an element of vulnerability. It implies a leap of faith, as people such as Mollering has argued. A leap of faith when you have to believe when there is no actual evidence for that belief. Trust also involves, I think, some level of emotional association that confidence may not do. We often think about the emotional angst that's caused uh, when someone's trust is abused. I trusted you. So ironically, perhaps, trust becomes more visible when it is absent or abused. So the absence of trust appears to make it present. <clears throat> so I now want to tell you a short story. Uh, it's almost become a mantra about trust and its absence, about the medical and science scandals such as BSE, foot and mouth, GM crops, medical incidents such as Harold Shipman murders, organ retention at Alderhey, and debates about MMR and the link to autism, through the issue of trust up between the medical system, politics and the publics. It was says these incidents had caused crisis of trust. Some, such as the philosopher Nora O'Neill, has argued that it wasn't a crisis. It was more a climate of suspicion. Brian Wynn, the Stiss scholar, has also argued against the creation myth. It assumes a period of time when we all trusted science and medicine, and now we don't. It also implies that somehow the public, that big thing again, somehow gives or withholds trust. I shall return to this point later. And finally, and most importantly, I think it should be mentioned, the negative views of any organisation or system do not preclude positive experiences on the individual level. And I think Mario's talk definitely pointed to that. So whether or not the crisis of trust was real or perceived, it aided a process and a new enthusiasm for public engagement and dialogue about new medical and scientific endeavours. Enter the social scientist. One thing that Mari has shown in her talk is that trust can be contextual, relational, and experiential. And what I want to talk about now is that trust can also be ambivalent. I want to talk a little bit about the research that Sarah Cunningham Burley, colleagues here in STIS, and I did with Generation Scotland, Scotland's population family genetic database. I hate saying this, but in 2003, <laughs> <laughs> we conducted a combination of stakeholder interviews and 10 focus groups with different subgroups of the Scottish population. I just want to highlight several themes that came about about trust and about participation that links to Mary's talk. There are three themes. The first theme is the idea of what we called, but I think Mary has also alluded to, homegrown trust. Homegrown trust. Generation Scotland had a particular Scottish flavour and seemed to combine the local experiences of living in Scotland with the national pride of being Scottish, of doing something for Scotland. As one clinician said, 
I suspect the public can see it as being owned within Scotland by Scottish academia and Scottish health, can see the involvement of individuals locally that they were aware of, and therefore, in general, trust. The second aspect of trust was the idea of relational trust, that patient groups were more likely to express willingness to participate because of their experience of and relationship to disease. But the last one, the last idea of trust was called, we called, and everybody knows it as, breached trust. There was a general distrust actually articulated towards abstract and large organisations. One person told us, I just don't trust the government. I don't trust anyone with secrecy. And importantly, I think in this context, access by non-health organisations were seen as having the potential to abuse the trust. Another said, I think I just wouldn't trust that there wasn't a kind of big business which wouldn't have ulterior motives behind it to cash in on this thing. Finally, I just want to turn now back to the story of a crisis of trust. As Wynne has suggested, the mantra of a crisis of trust in the 2000s may be something of a fairy tale. That's my words, not his. Trust and mistrust can coexist, and one does not necessarily cancel the other out. We may have to make these leaps of faith. We may have to trust, because mistrust certainly does exist, especially when it comes to large abstract organisations. As Giddens has argued, Anthony Giddens, and modern society is one that is characterised by such large abstract organisations. But trust can also be expressed in willingness to take part in large studies such as ALSPAC or Generation Scotland. So for Sarah and I, we then concluded that such participation might be conceptualised as both a token of trust, this is expressed in their willingness to take part in Generation Scotland or ALSPAC, but also as token trust. It is token trust because such participation means that people simultaneously have concerns about possible breaches of trust. Trust then is, I leave the last word to one of our focus group participants, talking about their willingness to invest in trust for the common good. She said and warned those in charge of organisations such as Generation Scotland that if they get it wrong, we'll betide them, we'll come back and haunt them. <laughs> so finally, and leading into Kate, <clears throat> by way of an introduction to Kate's talk, let me finish with a final example of how changes in context and what people originally signed up for may challenge the token trust involved in tokens of trust. One participant said, and so I think people are very sceptical to actually trust what a big organisation is saying to you. You've been promised to only use your blood sample for this and this and this, but I think we've all heard We've all been fed so many untruths about people who were deceived and were used in the past. You're trusting that they're using your blood for what you agreed to when you originally signed up for it. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Okay, so Jill's picked up on the issue of trust, and I think this, as she said, very much relates to what I'm going to talk to, which is the issue of context. So the issue of context is important on at least two levels in Marie's work. First, the choice of case study, a cohort study, in which the participants and those running the study spend many years together. Each new data collection or new project using the data enriches and deepens understandings of this context for those involved. This particular context is very special in that regard. And indeed, being a participant in Alspach has clearly become, for some participants, something like part of their identity shared with others in their school and local area. This context is reinforced in the case of ALSPAC with newsletters about the science that the ALSPAC study <coughs> supports. Plus, ALSPAC has literally been around for some of these original participants since they were born. Thus, providing data in this context creates an almost intimate relationship, as Mary said, reinforced by many, many interactions which form an empirical basis for trust. Second, contact is important in Murray's work because in a way that is exactly what is being challenged with data linkage and in the change in access arrangements brought about by collaborations and new funding conditions which encourage more sharing of data. 
As Murray suggests, context may have an ambiguous ethical role, and I will reflect on this very briefly at the end of what I'm going to say in relation to informed consent. So, in terms of context, I find the socio-ethical notion of contextual integrity proposed by Helen Nissenbaum to be useful in that it relates to expectations of data use and how these are shaped. The parameters of context are defined, she argues, by appropriateness and distribution. The former deals with what is appropriate information in a given context. For example, one does not discuss banking details with a doctor or, one med or one's medical history with the bank manager and would consider it inappropriate if such data were brought to bear in that context. The latter, distribution, relates to norms of flow of information. So, for example, you have expectations about confidentiality in the examples I've just shared with you, and you would be surprised and infuriated to find details of your medical history posted on your Facebook timeline. This one claims negative reactions are elicited when uses of data could not have been assumed to follow from the original context in which the data were given. Privacy scholar Schumann suggested back in 1984 that part of what people care about when other people know about them is that these things are understood in a certain light, with a particular kind of appreciation for the meaning these have for the subject. So to return to Nissenbaum and contextual integrity, this takes the focus away from what the data are and emphasises expectations regarding use as a basis for normative considerations of privacy protection and potentially other ethically relevant issues. So our point is not whether the data are intimate or sensitive, but how they are viewed in a particular setting, which will be linked to expectations of how they will be used. So, Murray talks about data being intimate, but given the trust built within the OSPAC, study, this is not necessarily an issue for most participants. It may be objective that this discussion is relevant only where data is identifiable. However, it may still be the case that uses of data are of interest to the individuals involved, both in terms of wanting their data used for some things and not others, but also because, as Arm said, in relation to the issue of profiling, in his 2010 paper entitled Broken Promise of Privacy, responding to the surprising failure of anonymization, profiles amalgamate data from different sources and may be used to discriminate against groups. Though, of course, I should say, with regard to the, the usual um, issue of insurance, which always comes up in this, in this discussion, there is a, a moratorium on this, which has now been extended to 2019. So challenges to context. So in relation to ALSPAT then, like other cohort studies, there is increasing interest in reusing them in the post genomic world as a, re a rich source of data collect collected prospectively, so not subject to recall bias and other problems of the case control design. So a very valuable source of data collected over an awfully long time in a very careful way. The 1958 cohort study, for example, served as a part of the control sample in the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium as long ago as 2007. In terms of current and recent developments relating to ALSPAC, genome-wide genotypes are also currently being generated for ALSPAC participants. ALSPAC is now part of several international consortia, including GIANT, looking at anthropometric uh, traits, MAGIC, continuous glycemic traits, EGG, Early Growth Genetics, Gabrielle, Asthma and Related Genotypes in Eagle, Early Genetics and Life Course Epidemiology. So a lot of consortia, as Murray hinted at, are now using the ALSPAC data. Whilst genome-wide genome sequencing and genotype has been done for 9,912 subjects from ALSPAC, and the sequencing technologies necessary for this work were found at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge, and the Laboratory Corporation of America in Burlington, North Carolina. So the data is necessarily being shared with researchers, not in the UK, but further afield for health and genetics research. Meanwhile, the funders have changed. 
In July 2010, the Wellcome Trust renewed core funding for the project in partnership with the Medical Research Council. This totaled £6 million over, £6 million over three years, so it was a very significant investment. As funders, the Wellcome Trust have championed open access as far as possible through funding conditions and documents such as the Fort Lauderdale Agreement, which uh, the Welcome Trust produced in 2003, which is also known as Sharing Data from Large Scale Biological Research Projects, a tripartite system of responsibility. From this document, the Welcome Trust made it very, very clear that the way they saw cohort studies was not as discrete studies owned and managed by those running the cohort studies, rather, they saw them as community resources for use in wider uh, genetics, genomics research, health research. So just to wind up and to return to the ethical issues, and I'll, I'll talk about informed consent and context. So what job can informed consent do in this context? Or should we say, as this context becomes increasingly interlinked, added to, accessed and transformed, Broad consent is an attempt to outline for individuals what <coughs> will happen to their data so far as it is known or can be known. However, there is a possibility that Mary's presentation raises that the, the permission in informed consent is tied, at least in the mind of participants, to ideas about information flow in a particular context, that of ALSPAC, when what the context of ALSPAC means is increasingly complex.